Hi all, I hope all is well. Um, today I'm gonna just jump right into the notes because this is gonna be a heady video. We got a lot of stuff to do in this one. So last time we introduced some, well we reviewed some algebra, really algebra interpretation, interpreting a slope, interpreting an intercept, what are the components of a linear equation. Today I'm gonna introduce regression, which when you hear the regression the word regression, you should think, okay, this means using data to estimate linear equations. That's what regression is. So that's why it's part of statistics, is that you've spent all this time in your life learning about linear equations, but where do linear equations come from? Well, sometimes they just come from a math book. Here's a made up linear equation that you need to do a bunch of work on. Well, now we're going to get to the real power of algebra comes from using real world data to estimate linear relationships. And then we can make all of those algebraic exercises we do a lot more meaningful by going and getting real world relationships. So let's start off. Uh oh, maybe my Apple Pencil will make it. Let's start off by going into a research question of the type we might answer using regression. So let's say, do higher oil prices lead to higher gasoline prices? Probably yes they do because oil prices are the main ingredient in gasoline, the stuff we put in our cars to drive around. So they probably do, but we can answer that question with data and statistics. But what's nice about regression and what we usually wanna do is ask this secondary question right here, <coughs> How much do oil prices affect gasoline prices? We can also answer that secondary question, and that question is probably more important in a business context. Is like, hey, we can answer a much more specific question than whether they oil prices increase gasoline prices. We can actually say by how much, and we'll do that by interpreting the slope of our estimated linear equation. So once we have a research question in the regression environment, the first thing we could do is write down the population regression equation that kind of is implicit to answer asking this research question in the first place. So for this, we would write, well, what's our dependent variable? Gas price, I'll call it, because that based on this research question, that guy right there is our dependent variable. So we'll call it gas price in the equation. So dependent variable then equals beta naught, which is some unknown population intercept for the equation, plus our population slope, beta one, multiplied by our independent variable, which is oil price in this case. And then we have an error term as we discussed in the last video. We don't think this relationship is gonna be perfect because there's other stuff, random stuff is gonna affect gas prices. Like maybe the gas truck for your local gas station crashed on the way to the gas station. That's gonna probably increase prices at that gas station, but that is unrelated to oil. So random events like that live in this error term right here. But our research question right here, do higher oil prices lead to higher gasoline prices? That question is about this unknown population parameter. Just like in the past, we had questions about population means. Now we have a question about a population slope because this question is about the relationship between an independent variable and a dependent variable. And that slope right there defines the relationship between those. It tells us also the answer to how much do oil prices affect gasoline prices. So that's our population regression equation associated with this research question. Now, we can't get our hands on the population data for reasons we've discussed in the past. There's gonna be oil prices and gas prices in the future. Obviously, we can't collect oil and gas prices from the year 2021. So it's literally impossible for me to get my hands on all of the di population data. But what I can do is take a sample and estimate a sample regression equation 
The way we write the notation for that is gas price equals B naught plus B1 times oil price plus E. So that's just the sample version of the equation. But notice once I take a sample, I actually get numbers. And I'll show you exactly where these numbers came from in the second part of this video using Excel. But notice that for the sample, I can get my hands on the numbers because I use math to estimate them. And now I can write gas price equals 0 0.85, so 85 cents, plus 0 0.027, about 3 cents, times oil price, plus error. Because even in the sample, this is not going to be a perfect relationship in the data, right? So we do have to account for this error. Another way I could write this without writing the error is I could say gas price with a hat over it. That means predicted gas price. What gas price would I predict based on different oil prices? Well, I would predict that the gas price is 85 cents plus 0 0.027 times whatever the oil price is. And then I don't have to write the error because in this written, written this way, the sample equation is about the estimated gas price and not the true gas price that I observe in the data. So those are two different ways to write the sample equation once you have a regression. Now let's interpret the slope because now we can actually answer our sub question. How much do oil prices affect gasoline prices? That's the slope. That's a question about the slope. Well, if oil price increases by $1, gas price increases by, by 2.7 cents on average, or about three cents on average. So each time oil price increases by one, gas price increases by about three cents. That's how I would interpret that slope. Why is it not like a $1 to $1? Well, one thing in the data, oil prices are per barrel, gas prices are per gallon, as you might have suspected, because that's what you pay when you go to the store. So part of it is just that barrels are a lot bigger than gallons, which is one reason this slope isn't closer to a dollar. But so you want to think about issues like that. How is my underlying data measured? That's going to affect your interpretation of this slope right here or of the estimated slope. So one question you might have is where do the es estimates come from? So when we were doing means, it was easy. We took a sample. We added up all the numbers in the sample and then divided by the sample size, and that gives us a mean. It's not quite so simple to get our hands on an intercept and a slope. So let's just first think about what this data is going to look like. So we're going to go collect data on oil and gas prices. And something you're going to do for the project and something we're going to do later in this video is draw a scatter plot. So on a scatter plot, <coughs> I always want my independent variable on the x-axis and my dependent variable on the y-axis. So what is my dependent variable? Gas price. What's my independent variable? Oil price. So when I go collect data, these are gonna be numbers, right? And I'd be able to put them on a scatter plot. So I'll get a bunch of data points that maybe look like this. And then what I want to do is I want to draw the line through this data that results in the best fit. So clearly from the data points, I'm going to get an upward sloping line. Well, what line is better? This line? So line one or line two. Those both look pretty good, but how do I decide which one is better? Because I notice I just want this one slope estimate. So the way we decide that is let's just consider this one point right here. So this combination of this oil price 
and this gas price right here. Well, I missed on both lines, right? That's my error. Now we can see where this E right here comes from. That's because we do not expect these things to fit perfectly in the data. This distance from line two right here is the E, the error term for that point. Because clearly these lines don't go through every point. And in fact, it would be impossible to draw a straight line through all of these points of data, right? The only way to do it would be to make a super curvy line, but then that wouldn't be a linear relationship anymore. So we have to somehow decide what is the best line to write. So, well, if we were just using that point, we'd say line two is better because line two is closer to that point than line one. But what about this point right here? That point is closer to line one than to line two, right? So if I were using that point, I would want to choose line one. So clearly we have to think about a more holistic way to choose all the points. And what we do is we say, well, I want the line that minimizes. So this is called the least squares criterion. If you're going to choose something that you want to be the best, you have to choose, well, what criterion defines the best? And we use what's called least squares here. Ordinary least squares, it's sometimes called. So consider, so what we do here is we minimize the sum, so the uh, adding up everything, the sum of squared errors. In math, and I don't need you to memorize this math because I really care more about you just understanding where these come from than actually cranking out the math. So just thinking about this for a second, the reason that we square the errors is that this error right here is positive. So it's fine to add that. But here we have a negative error. So if we were adding positives and negatives together, that would like help us every time we got a negative error. So you might say like, oh, just put the line way up here because then every error is a negative. And when we add a bunch of negative numbers together, we'll get a tiny sum of squared errors. And so let's just put the line as high as possible to get a bunch of negative errors. Well, that obviously doesn't make sense. So the way to get rid of those negative errors is we square them. In math, what we'd say is we'd say minimize. That's, what's, that's the same thing as minimize right here, M-I-N for minimize. The sum, you've seen that before in statistics, that means add up the stuff after me, of each error, I, squared. So I have I just means E1 would be, so here's my first point. It would be the error for that point. E2 would be for this point, my second point, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. So you have to add up all of those for every single point. So starting at your first observation and going to your nth observation, the sample size, you just minimize that. Find every error term, square it, Choose the line such that this is the smallest number possible. That's how we choose our intercept and slope. There's an infinite number of different lines we could choose. So we have to choose some criterion for picking a line. We use the least squares criterion, which means square and add up every error term for every possible line. Pick the line that has the smallest sum of squared errors right here. That is our criterion. So that's where our sample slopes come from. In Excel, you do not have to like do the math that underlies this. Excel and a wide variety of other computer software systems do this all automatically for you. So when you actually go to do this, you're just going to get in the results. A number is going to pop out for your slope. So I just mainly want you to know, well, where is that number even coming from? This is where it comes from, the least squares criterion. Okay, of course, we're going to do hypothesis testing because look at this first research question. Do higher oil prices lead to higher gasoline prices? 
Notice if that the population slope is positive, then the answer to that question is yes. Which one do I deal with? Which hypothesis do I deal with when my answer is yes? My alternative. Beta 1. So we just said if the population slope is greater than 0, the answer to this research question, do higher oil prices lead to higher gasoline prices? The answer to that question is yes if the population slope is greater than 0. The answer is no if it's less than or equal to zero. So there we go. We have a hypothesis test. Guess what? Sample slopes, B1, are random variables. Because if I took a different random sample of oil and gas prices, I would get a slightly different slope estimate, right? Guess what type of distribution those come from? Yep, you guessed it bell curve, this is gonna be, we'll be dealing with T distributions for these types of estimates for the most part. Guess where this is centered? At the truth. You already basically know how to do hypothesis testing now. So equals question mark is zero. Why zero? Because zero is the number that divides my tr my alternative and my null hypothesis, if I land way out here, maybe this is a 5% area, the rejection region, I will reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. What will I do that based on? Well, I'll either look at a critical value and compare it to a t-statistic, or I'll look at a p-value and compare it to a significance level. And you've already, currently, you're taking a quiz that hopefully you understand those issues. Otherwise, you're going to be struggling before this section anyway. But the logic behind hypothesis testing is exactly the same when we're doing regression as it was before. The only thing new now is that we're looking at slopes, population slopes, and sample slopes. But the distribution they come from is still a bell curve, and all of that other logic stays the same. Either critical value approach or p-value approach, and you'll get plenty of practice with that when you do your homework and work through these chapters. Now, one last thing that I wanted to mention real quickly is oftentimes we like to know, well, how well does our line, our linear relationship, Explain the data. So consider these two scatter plots. Maybe I have one scatter plot here that looks like this. And I get, I use the least squares method and I get this line versus. I collect some other data and get a scatter plot like this. And I get exactly the same slope in the intercept. So can I just say, oh yeah, I got I did exactly the same analysis. There's no difference really between these scatter plots because I got exactly the same line in both cases. Well, what's the obvious difference in these scatter plots? This one has a better fit, we'd say. So this is a better fit because the line is more closely aligned with the relationship between the points. Here, in this one, we have kind of a wild fit up here, right? There's a lot of big errors. And so the number we use to compare these two situations is called the coefficient of determination, but it's actually more commonly referred to as the R squared, R squared, or R square. So anytime you see that, this is what the is being returned, this type of comparison. How well does my line, my straight line that I drew through the points, fit through the point. So this is going to be a low R squared, and this is going to be a high 
r squared. Okay? And so I'm gonna do a little bit more detail on the r squared in the future because I don't want this get video to get too crazy. But basically, the number, the r squared answers, because part of it is just gonna be the interpretation, how much of the variation in the dependent variable, oops, is explained by the regression. So the, the linear relationship. How much of the variation in gas price, for example, is explained by oil price? And so let's say this one is like 0 0.10 and this one is 0 0.90. Because your R squareds, it turns out, are always going to be between 0 and 1. And they have a really nice interpretation. So if r square equals 0 0.1, you can say this regression explains 10% because 0.1 as a proportion is the same thing as 10%, right? This regression explains 10% of the variation in the dependent variable. On the other hand, if it was r squared equals 0.9, you'd say this regression explains 90% of the variation in the dependent variable. If we were doing our oil price gas price example and we got r squared equals 0.9, we could be more specific and we could say Oil prices explain 90% of the variation in gasoline prices because the only thing in the regression in that case is oil prices. So when we say this regression, we mean basically conditioning on oil prices explains 90% of the variation in gas prices. When we're doing a regression model, the things we care about are one, interpreting the slope so we can answer this secondary question. How much do oil prices affect gasoline prices? That comes down to the slope interpretation. That's always number one with regression, especially in a business environment. So I'm gonna write these down so you remember to always do these when you run a regression. Important interpretations Important interpretation of regression results. Those are the big three I like to call them. So one is going to be interpret the slope. The slope estimate. So that's, we did that when we said when oil prices increase by $1, gasoline prices increase by 2.7 cents on average in our data. That's interpreting the slope. That tells us about the magnitude of the effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable. Two, is the slope statistically significant? So the second thing you're gonna do is you're gonna take a look at either a p-value or a test statistic, and you're gonna compare that either to your significance level or to your critical value. You already know how to do that, but that's the second thing I always want you to think about right after you get the results of your regression. One, interpret the slope. Two, is the slope statistically significant? Three, how much of the variation in 
the dependent variable is explained by the regression. Woo! And what are you going to use for that? You're going to use the R squared or coefficient. These are the same thing again. Just writing them two different ways. Coefficient of determination. It's almost always determination. Almost always referred to as the R squared. But these are the big three. And you're going to have to do these three things. Actually, I think you just need to do this one for your project draft. But definitely all three of these for your final project when you do this with the own, your own data that you collect. Okay, and the next video is actually just about what you need to do for your project draft. Okay, but now I'm going to jump over to Excel. I'm going to show you I'm actually going to run this regression with oil and gas prices using data that I just collected. And we'll be able to take a look at all of this stuff in Excel. So I'll see you in a second. Hey, y'all. So here we are in Excel, as promised. And I collected this data right here on previous month oil futures price which basically when your markets for oil trade for all types of different months. So you can bet on prices for oil today or next month because people are purchasing oil. For example, gasoline retailers and refiners are buying the oil that they will use in next month already right now. So that makes sense to use as the price is what were they using for their oil price for this month when they were deciding last month because obviously they have to do stuff in advance so that's just what futures means here is our regular gasoline price per gallon these are much higher because these are per barrel there's many gallons in a barrel i think about 30 but that's not exactly right and here is our prices per gallon. So the reason these are much lower is just because of the unit of measurement. But a couple of important things I wanted to point out to you is that when we're doing regression, we always have matched or paired data. So this oil price was for January 2000. It was actually decided in December 1999, but was for January 2000. This regular gasoline price was also for January 2000. So those two observations are matched by the month that they occurred in. And so I was able to collect, collect the data starting in January 2000 to April 2020. Okay. So you're going to have to do the following for your draft. And so one thing that's going to make your life easier for this first part, because you're going to have to go collect your own data based on whatever research question you come up with. And that's something you should start focusing on sooner than later, because the hardest part will be collecting your data. Once you have your data, though, for the scatter plot part, you will want your independent variable, which is oil price for us, to the left of your dependent variable, which is gasoline. Once I have my data organized in this manner, I can highlight just my independent and dependent variable. Notice I'm not highlighting the month. And so I've highlighted my independent on the left, dependent on the right variables. And then I do insert. And right here, one of the options for charts is a scatter plot. And we can just pick the first option. So this is just like what I was showing you in the notes, but now with real data, right? And I can hover over. So this point right here, we have an oil price of $64.04 per barrel. And that occurred in a month when gasoline prices were $3.13. Okay. So that gives us some more information. This is just a map of this data scatter plot. So on here, on this axis, we have oil prices. And on this axis, we have gasoline prices. And I encourage you, one of the really valuable things you can get out of this class is a learning about making good looking charts that are informative in Excel. 
So if I go right here, I'm on chart design. By being clicked on the chart, it'll bring you into that tab. Add chart element. Axis titles, primary horizontal axis. I could write, this is oil price. And now, when, some, when my reader or my consumer reads this chart, they know that this is oil prices. I could also go ahead and right click this axis, format axis, number, currency. I don't need any decimal places because I don't have change, but right there now it's clear that those are dollars. Here on gas prices, format axis, number, currency. Maybe I will do decimal points there because we do have 50 cent units. I'd also probably want to insert a primary vertical axis so that I can write gasoline. Gasoline price. So stuff like this is just making, we're going to put this chart in a professional looking document later so we want it to look good this is kind of a lame title title so we maybe could write nah, oil price versus regular gasoline price or something like that something better than what they come up with. Excel oftentimes will make your chart title by default chart title. And I will take a point off if you turn in a draft that has a chart in it and the title of that chart is chart title. Deleting the title chart title and leaving it blank is a much better title for a chart than chart title is. So remember that. I will make fun of you in the comments on your draft if you show me a chart with the title chart title. This is your warning. So now let's get to those regressions. So we know that the least squares criteria is what used. That looked complicated, but it's not complicated in Excel. Once I have a scatter plot, I can add a trend line right here. And of course, Excel chooses small blue dots in the ocean of large blue dots, which is horrible. So I'm gonna do the paint bucket make it red, make it thick. You can do this however you want. I think it's just better to make the line something you can see. So that is our estimated equation line. That is our sample regression. So right now it's just a line, so I don't have an equation. But that line, every straight line has an equation associated with it. And one of our options, if we click on this trend line, over here is display R squared. That's the coefficient of determination and the equation on chart. And now we have these nice results. Let's put them somewhere we can see them, make them bold maybe, just make them look better for the reader. Right here it says Y, I'm gonna change that to gas price. Cause that's more informative, right? My dependent variable is gasoline price. My independent variable is oil price. So remember in the notes I said when oil price increases by 1, <coughs> gas price increases by 0 0.027 or 2.7 cents. That's right there. That's the slope. 85 cents was the intercept that we wrote down in the notes a second ago. This is That's where I got these numbers, right here. Hey Google, stop. 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 Sorry about that. Google's Googling me. Does Google Google stuff? I don't know. R squared, that's the coefficient of determination. With that number, I can say oil price explains about 91% of the variation in gasoline price. So that's a lot, right? If I think about, okay, gasoline prices obviously vary. If you drive a car or know somebody that does, you know that. Well, why do they vary? Well, 91% of the variation comes from variation in oil prices. So when you see in the news that oil prices go way down or go way up, 
you can bet that gas prices are going to go way up or way down because right here, this line shows you that the relationship, okay? Notice also that this line clearly does not go through every point. Each of these points have error terms associated with them, but apparently this particular line is the one that minimizes the sum of those error terms squared, okay? So the other thing, so notice we got the slope interpretation and the R squared just using this scatter plot. One thing that this does not allow us to do is to know whether this is a statistically significant slope estimate. Meaning, is this slope big enough to land in the rejection region for the hypothesis test? We actually have to use something different for that, and you'll also have to do this for your final project, although not for your final draft. So let's go ahead. One really nice trick is I can keep this. I'm going to make a history of my data science project by first just the first thing I'm going to do is make a scatter plot. And I'm going to label it nicely. This is probably going to go in my report. But then I want to use this data again, but not get rid of this sheet that I just made. So I'm going to make a copy of this tab. Okay. And so I get exactly the same thing back. Notice these are exactly the same thing. Well, I already have my scatter plot on the other one, so I'll delete this. I'll call this one the simple regression. It's simple because there's only one independent variable. And so for this, to get at statistical significance to do our hypothesis test on our slope, <coughs> is we're going to do data, data analysis. Ooh, look at that, regression. Okay. Input Y range, we're going to feed it our dependent variable. Our dependent variable is gasoline price. I'm going to include the labels on that because the labels will be used in the results if I do so. Then it wants my independent variable, which is oil price here. I included labels, so I have to click this. Confidence level, if you want to get a different confidence interval or something like that, I'll just leave that there for now. Clearly the default is 95%. Let's do an output range and just put these results right next to our data. And then click OK. And here we go. So here's the results of our regression. Notice right here is our R squared. We already saw that on the scatter plot, same number. The scatter plot rounded it to 0 0.9064, I believe. It's less rounded here, but clearly that would, would round to 0 0.9064, but still saying that about 91% of the variation in gasoline prices can be explained by oil prices. The next thing we want to look at, so I'm thinking about those last three things I mentioned, is really the first thing we want to look at is the slope estimate itself right there. So again, when oil prices increase by $1, gasoline prices increase on average by about 2.7 cents. There is that same intercept from our equation again. Here's the standard error of that slope estimate. So guess how you get the T statistic from the slope? You take the estimate and you divide it by the standard error. You've seen that before. Here we're 48. That's a massive T stat, which of course will lead to a tiny P value. This P value is written in scientific notation. So that's basically zero. That's a decimal point with 125 zeros after it before we get to a first number. So that is a tiny p-value at any significance level. So 5%, clearly that p-value is less than 5%. It's also less than 10% or 1%. So at any conventional significance level, I would reject the null hypothesis. Notice that the scatter plot gave us two out of the three things we care about. It gave us our slope estimate, and it gave us our R squared. The one thing it does not give you is the T stat or the P value, and you need that for the hypothesis test. Okay? 
Some other things the book will have you go over later are the significance level. So notice that these two numbers are exact, or significance F, sorry. That's for a different type of hypothesis test. In the case of simple linear regression, those two numbers are going to be exactly the same. But when we get into the next chapter about multiple linear regression, when we have more than one independent variable, we'll have many different p-values because we'll have another row down here with a new independent variable in it. But you don't have to worry about that too much for now. The main things I want you to focus on are the r-squared, slope, whether that slope is statistically significant. All right, so we showed kind of the theory that underlies regression in the notes, and this is how we implement that stuff using a scatter plot or using the data analysis tool pack in Excel. There's some other functions that the book might show you that Excel has to use, has for these things. For example, I could do equals slope, known wise. That's my independent my dependent variables are known x's. And what do we get? There's that same slope again. So you can just grab the slope directly from Excel using a formula. But I like my favorite thing is to do the regression, the scatter plot, which you'll have to do for your draft, followed by the regression analysis, which gives you kind of more detailed information about the underlying characteristics of your regression analysis. All right, so that's it for implementing regression in Excel. Make sure to let me know if you have any questions. This stuff is gonna be really important for the rest of the class, both in terms of homework, quizzes, and especially for your project, because you will be doing a regression analysis for your project. And I will talk to you in the next video about the specific requirements for the project to draft. All right, I'll see you.